The following is part of a national PBS series called Sinking Cities, produced in conjunction with Peril and Promise, a WNET New York initiative telling stories of climate change around the world. I'm here with Torbjorn Torquist, who is a professor of earth and environment science at Tulane, and we are here at the Bayou Bienvenue Wetland Triangle. Tor, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So we're here to talk about subsidence, and subsidence is the natural sinking of the land. Generally speaking, why does it happen, and why do we consider it to be a natural process? Well, it is indeed in this region in coastal Louisiana, it is to a large extent a natural process, but it's not only natural, and certainly not here in New Orleans, uh, where you know the sinking of, of the city is very much a result of uh, human activities. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, if we look here behind us, uh, you know, Bayou Bienvenue is a really good example of an area and we can still see, see that it used to be a swamp and now it's open water. We see that, of course, on a very large scale uh, along uh, all of coastal Louisiana, wetlands that have disappeared and subsidence has been a big part of that, not the only part, but a big part. Most of that occurs because of, of sediments that uh, fresh sediments that accumulate at the surface and that are very water rich and they compress very, very quickly. And as a result, that land surface is constantly sinking. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about most of coastal Louisiana is like that, right? Yes, uh, at least, you know, certainly all the wetland areas mm -hmm. are, are subject to this process. And so it's mostly a natural process, but you mentioned there are ways that um, human activity can, can impact that. And so what about oil and gas extraction, for example? I know there are well, some people who say that that can impact the rate at which the land sinks. It certainly does. I mean, we see that worldwide. Anytime you extract uh, fluids from the subsurface, it's going to lead to sinking at the surface. And uh, that's very well documented in, in many, many places. And that is certainly a contributing factor uh, here in Louisiana. It's obviously going to be more localized. It's, it's more directly associated with you know, where the oil and gas fields are. It's probably not the dominant factor, um, although you know, more research is needed to, to kind of figure that out in more detail. Um, the other human uh, factor is what we see here in the city and in, in many urban areas where you know New Orleans expanded tremendously over the past century or so because we started to drain swamps and when you start doing that the land is going to start sinking very very rapidly and that is exactly what has happened here uh, what happens in addition to that is we extract groundwater and you know, just like oil and gas, if you extract groundwater from the subsurface, land is going to sink. But again, in, usually in, in smaller areas, right around the point of extraction. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you're a researcher who studies subsidence a lot. So can you give me a sense of what kind of tools you use? Like what do you actually, how do you actually figure out how much we're sinking? Well, that is uh, an interesting question and there's many answers to this. Uh, we use a very wide range of techniques and uh, you know even within my group we use a set of different things but there's many other techniques that that colleagues work with they all tend to require a lot of expertise so there is there's no single researcher that has the ability to do all these different things but what's really important to understand the subsidence problem here in Louisiana is uh, a network of monitoring stations that came into existence uh, basically during the years after uh, Hurricane Katrina. It's, uh, you know, it's basically a state initiative uh, to set up, uh, you know, about 400 monitoring stage stations. It's called a coastwide reference uh, monitoring system. And at each of these sites, uh, all kinds of things are measured. There are a number of tools that measure the change in land elevation and in addition, what's measured is the rate of uh, accretion of new sediment at the surface. And between those two measurements, it's possible to calculate the shallow subsidence rates. And we have now found, and that's becoming increasingly clear, that what happens in a very shallow subsurface is really dominating everything. Okay. So uh, that's one of the methods. Uh, 
another approach that we've used for many years is to study uh, the rate of sea level change that has happened in this wider region over the last, say, 10,000 years. Um, and that can give us a lot of information on longer term uh, geological processes that contribute to subsidence. And those exist too, uh, but they are comparatively much smaller. So it's really about what happens in the uppermost couple of feet. So I want to talk about uh, numbers really quickly if we can. Yeah. So um, if we look at the coast of Louisiana, about how much are we sinking on average per year? Well, if you look at, at the coast altogether and you, you know, you look for some kind of average value because there is quite a lot of variation from one place to the other. You know, something we ultimately want to aim for is to figure out what we call the rate of relative sea level rise. And that is basically the sum of subsidence, all these different processes that we, we talked about, plus the rate of sea level rise that happens no matter what because of climate change. And it turns out that in coastal Louisiana, that average rate is about half an inch per year right now. And that means uh, that rate is about four times higher than the global average. So uh, and that's including that the, the sinking and the, the seas rising. So you have yeah. both happening. Yeah. At the same. Okay. yeah. And that's why it's such a big problem here in Louisiana, because, you know, the sinking the substance component is about 75% of that, that number of that half an inch per year. The other 25% is from uh, you know, the climate driven sea level rise. But what's really important to keep in mind that in the future, you know, towards the end of this century, uh, the climate related component is gonna become more and more important. And eventually it's probably gonna dominate because we're expecting to see very, very high rates of sea level rise in the future. And so when we, you mentioned that there, some parts of the state are sinking at different rates than others. So if we kind of look at a map, which, which parts of the state are sinking faster? Or uh, maybe another way of putting that is, um, which parts of the state are more vulnerable right now? If we, if we try to map it out in that kind of way, as a general rule, the closer you go to the coast, the, the higher the rates. And uh, it's, it's likely that the, the highest rates are occur, you know, near the mouth of the river, for example. And there is a variety of reasons for that. One of them is that in that area, we have a very, very, very thick layer of these recent, very water rich sediments that are compacting relatively fast. Um, there are other areas that are also sinking a little bit faster than than surrounding regions, but that's uh, more uh, localized. Besides the Mouth of the River, what's another sort of hot spot or two? Uh, there is actually an area over in uh, the south southwestern part of the state, in the, what we call the Chenier Plain, that uh, turns out to be subsiding more rapidly than uh, you know the average number for the entire coastal zone. I have not specifically looked into what goes on in that area, but I have been, uh, you know, I, a couple of years ago, we presented these findings during a meeting and, uh, uh, you know, one of the people in the audience who was very familiar with that area actually confirmed that um, that may actually be related to um, artificial drainage that is happening at a, at a larger scale than in surrounding areas. So that could very well be, uh, be a factor. One of the things I'm wondering is, you know, we hear a lot about coastal land loss in the state, and it sounds like subsidence is a big part of that. But if we imagine the whole coastal land loss crisis as maybe a, a pie, what percentage of that pie is related to subsidence versus sea level rise versus storms or human stuff like oil and gas extraction? Well, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm going to give you a surprising answer. The subsidence component is actually very, very small. And the reason for that is it, it's obviously a very important factor that we need to understand. And uh, you could certainly frame it in this way that a lot of what we see, like right here behind me, is related to subsidence. But we also have to remember that because a lot of that is a natural process, that has been going on for thousands of years. And despite that, this 
delta and this coast has been growing over time. So what is the reason that that is now so different? Well, there is a variety of reasons for that, but uh, a very important one is that we built levees along the Mississippi River, which makes it much harder for sediment to disperse across these wetlands. And that was basically the process that offset the subsidence that was happening. And in fact, even overcompensated for it and allowed the delta to grow. Now we have completely reversed that. So that's, that's a huge factor. The other one is sea level rise, which right now is, uh, even though it's not yet the dominant factor, it's a lot more rapid than it used to be. It's, you know, if you compare the rates here in, you know, along the entire Gulf Coast here in the US, if you compare the rate that we see right now to what we saw a few hundred years ago before the Industrial Revolution, it's about four or five times higher. So that has started to play a role. And then in addition, of course, we have other human activities like you know, the, the digging of, of, of canals for oil and gas extraction primarily has had a tremendous impact on our wetlands. So, so it is a combination of things, but, but it's, I think it's fair to say that the degradation of our coast is really because of human activities. And, you know, we worry about subsidence because that makes the area much more vulnerable, but that on its own is actually not the main cause of the problem we're having. And then, so I guess to finish up, if we're trying to think about what can be done, like how do we sort of reverse this? Can it be reversed? Um, what sorts of projects or um, processes could we implement to address this issue of sinking? Well, the sinking, because it's, you know, so much of it is a natural process, we're not going to be able to stop that. Um, but you know, what we can do is allow river sediments to, you know, replenish these wetlands again. So that's why these river diversions that are planned are, are going to be absolutely crucial. Without that, it's just not going to happen. But even with that, it's only going to happen in certain areas. You know, the, we're not going to rebuild, uh, you know, large parts of the coast. That's just not going to happen. But the most important thing is is that we have to address climate change because if we don't do that then even the best river diversions on the planet are not gonna are not gonna bail us out sure well torbjorn torquist is a professor of earth and environmental science at tulane university and thanks so much for your time thank you major funding for sinking cities peril and promise was provided by dr p roy vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos, with additional funding from Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III and the Mark Haas Foundation. Additional funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Lise Strickler and Mark Gologli. Sinking Cities was also supported by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and viewers like you.